Okay, this lesson is about cooling towers, and uh, these are obviously an, an essential component of many chemicals plants. You know, lots of processes have to have uh, inlet streams of cool water to keep uh, temperature control, and so um, so this is something that you know you, you probably will encounter if you go in industry and do any design work. Uh, so a cooling tower is uh, that tall thing at the edge of the plant with the big plume of steam coming out of it. Uh, so it's uh, really just warm, moist air, and it's condensing in the air most of the time. Uh, but this is the uh, the basic idea. So hot water comes out of the plant, and uh, there's a sprayer uh, that, that disperses that water over some packing or some wooden slats or something inside the column, and that drips down through uh, this column, uh, and running counter current to that is a uh, dry air stream that runs upward and gradually uh, becomes becomes uh, becomes warmer and wetter as it goes up the column and uh, of course the hot water is becoming cooler and cooler because it's uh, it's supplying the heat of vaporization uh, to go into the into the uh, the plume going out the top okay so that's basically uh, what a uh, cooling tower is doing uh, but in this lesson we're going to quantify uh, how much water can be cooled uh, using this simple device of this type and the, the important variables in this problem are the humidity of air, that is kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air, uh, and the enthalpy of air, uh, that's per unit mass of the dry air, and the temperature of the liquid water stream that's uh, flowing down through this uh, bed, and the uh, temperature of the air uh, that is flowing upward uh, through the tower. Um, certain uh, parameters in the in the theory that we're going to derive here are going to be taken to be constants. Uh, water flow rate we're going to assume as a constant. That's a bit of an approximation because obviously there is some uh, water evaporating out of this hot water stream and going out the top of the column. But we're going to assume that that's a very small fraction of what goes uh, out the bottom of the column. And in practice, um, the textbooks say that turns out to be a pretty good assumption. Uh, so, the uh, G is going to stand uh, for the flow rate of dry air in kilograms per second. Uh, parameter A, as it has in the last couple of lessons, is going to be the interfacial area per unit volume inside the tower. And we have uh, heat capacity of air, we have the heat capacity of water. Uh, the heat capacity of air, by the way, tends to be a fairly strong function of the humidity. Uh, so, so, you know, in practice, for numerical calculations, you would want to include that. And Gene Coplis, for example, has a lot of, uh, you know, recommendations for doing those kinds of calculations. Uh, we're also going to take to be a constant the, uh, the heat of vaporization of water and uh, the mass transfer coefficient with respect to mole fractions of water in the gas phase. So uh, this, this uh, description of a cooling tower is going to involve uh, a few different balance equations and we'll start with an overall, uh, with an overall energy balance uh, to obtain what we call an operating line. Okay, so here's basically the idea. I put a, you know, control volume now encloses the entire tower and so I've got a, a hot liquid stream of water coming in the top and a uh, cool liquid stream of water coming out the bottom. I've got my my dry air stream coming in the bottom and my moist air at higher temperature coming out the top. And uh, so we can balance the energy accumulated in, in uh, this control volume, of course, is zero. In this case, this is going to be running at steady state. And so we've got zero equals the, the heat flow into uh, the wet air. Uh, that is going to be the, uh, the dry air flow rate multiplied by the enthalpy uh, coming coming uh, in at the bottom minus the enthalpy leaving at the top uh, and and so uh, so this must be compensated by the heat lost uh, from the water must be exactly compensated by those two things so we've got our warm water stream coming in the top and our cold water stream coming out the bottom the sum of these two contributions must go to zero right uh, so now uh, this gives us that um, this gives us that uh, the enthalpy at the top is equal to the enthalpy at the bottom 
uh, plus this L times C uh, heat capacity of the liquid divided by the dry air flow rate uh, multiplied by the temperature difference for that liquid stream. Okay, so this now is going to provide an operating line. And we'll, let, me, let me go ahead and go down now and show you where that operating line is on one of these diagrams. So we've got an, we've got an enthalpy axis in the vertical direction and a temperature axis in the horizontal direction. And uh, this uh, TL sub zero is the um, is the outlet liquid temperature, which is cool. Uh, the inlet liquid temperature is hot. That's at, uh, at position L, the top of the of the tower. And the operating line goes from some initial value of the well, some initial value of the enthalpy actually being up here, downward uh, to uh, this final value of the enthalpy. Uh, but but remember that we're describing the enthalpy of the uh, of the gas phase on the vertical axis. So, so the gas phase uh, is, um, is coming in at the bottom and going out at the top. Okay, so you want to keep, keep in mind that all of this is in this counter current flow regime. All right, so, so let's return back up to here. So we've derived our equilibrium line uh, by an overall energy balance. And now we're going to derive an, an equilibrium I'm sorry, we've derived our operating line by an overall energy balance. Now we're going to derive the equilibrium line uh, by just realizing that the enthalpy of the air depends on both its temperature and its humidity. Okay, so we can write down uh, that the enthalpy is going to involve a heat capacity because the, there's a sensible heat factor that is, that is changing the temperature of the air as it goes through the tower. And there's also a term due to the heat of vaporization. Okay, so the more, uh, the more, um, uh, water gets evaporated into the air, the more enthalpy it takes along with it into that into that new stream. Uh, so, at the liquid vapor interface, uh, we have technically that the mole fraction of water in the vapor is the saturation value at the temperature on the interface. Uh, but we're going to assume that that temperature on the interface is actually just the temperature in the liquid bulk because the conductivity of water is much much greater than that of air. Uh, so, so now with this approximation, the enthalpy at saturation becomes uh, the heat capacity term plus the heat of vaporization term, uh, both evaluated at the temperature of the liquid phase. Okay, so, so what is this describing again? Uh, this is describing the enthalpy if the gas was in equilibrium with the liquid at its current conditions, right? So it's important to recognize that this is not the that this equation does not reflect the true enthalpy of the gas stream. Uh, this reflects the enthalpy of the gas stream that would exist if it had come to equilibrium with that liquid stream. Okay, so uh, so it's also uh, important to remember that the uh, the mole fraction of water uh, in the vapor phase at saturation is a very strong function of the temperature. And so that means that the equilibrium line is going to be quite curved upwards, right? So it's not really a line at all. Uh, anyway, we call it an equilibrium line. And so we've got our operating line, which is a straight line, and our equilibrium line, which is a curve. And this gap in the enthalpy is the gas side driving force at the water inlet, right? So at the high temperature. Uh, so, so this is the gas side driving force. And what does it mean? It means that uh, you take this enthalpy that would exist if the gas stream was in equilibrium with the liquid, and the actual enthalpy of the gas stream is this point down here, and the air uh, is always at a lower enthalpy than it should be, in a sense, uh, and therefore heat transfer is always going from the liquid stream to the gas stream to try and bring it up towards this equilibrium line. And that's the way uh, the driving force works for this, this cooling tower. So uh, another thing to note here is that there is a maximum possible value of this L over G ratio. That is the uh, liquid flow rate to gas flow rate has a maximum possible value. Okay, so if the L over G, wh why is that? Let me let me just return to the shape of the operating line. Notice well, the heat, we can't do much about the heat capacity of water, but we can adjust this liquid flow rate and the gas flow rate and change the slope of this operating line. Right. So if we change the slope of the operating line so much that it intersects 
with the equilibrium line, then the driving force for heat transfer has vanished and we will no longer be able to cool our stream to the desired uh, output temperature. Okay, so, so that says that there's a maximum in this L over G slope, right? Uh, this L over G factor in the slope. And uh, so that's a key part of the part of the process for designing a, a cooling tower, right? You want to stay securely away uh, from conditions where uh, those two things might cross and uh, start to give you a very incomplete uh, cooling of your water stream. Okay, so now the last uh, bit of our derivation is to consider the mass transfer rate and the heat transfer rate. So we've got water accumulation in the gas side. If we're running at steady state, that's just zero. And that should be equal to the water convection in and out uh, of, the, um, of the little slice uh, between location Z and Z plus delta Z. Okay, so here's our our uh, gas flow rate in terms of dry air multiplied by the mole fraction uh, that is um, the mole fraction of water in the gas phase at these two different locations. Uh, so that's now the difference in the water content uh, flowing in and flowing out of our little control volume and we've got uh, that little control volume is associated with an area per packing uh, times a delta Z and then if I take that uh, and multiply by the mass transfer coefficient now, that is the actual new water that's entering the vapor stream in uh, this interval between Z and Z plus delta Z. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's the uh, source term, if you will, and this is the uh, flow in and flow out term in this equation. Now we're just going to do the standard thing, take the limit as delta Z goes to zero, and we recover uh, this pretty simple equation where we've got a gas flow rate, uh, derivative of our water content as a function of Z, uh, minus a, a mass transfer coefficient multiplied by Y uh, by the mole fraction driving force. So we can do the same kind of analysis for the heat transfer rate now. And so we know that the enthalpy accumulation in the gas side is also is going to be zero. And we have an energy convection term in and out. And we have energy added by heat transfer uh, from the uh, liquid stream to the vapor stream. Okay, so here's the heat transfer term. It has a heat transfer coefficient times an A. This looks basically exactly analogous to the thing that we just wrote down up here uh, for the mass transfer rate, uh, except that now on the left-hand side uh, we have a heat capacity times a gas flow rate times the derivative of temperature with respect to position in the reactor. Okay, so, uh, so let's go ahead and think about what kind of things we would want to do with the equations that we've already derived, right? So what we would like to be able to do is to obtain a design equation. And uh, we need to get that down to a single driving force. I've already told you that that's going to be the enthalpy. And so what we want to do is to construct a linear combination of heat and mass transfer rate equations. Those are the two that we just derived above these two equations, one for the mass transfer problem and one for the heat transfer problem. And we want to mix these in a linear combination that will give us an enthalpy rate equation. That is a derivative with respect to Z of our expression for the enthalpy in terms of the temperature and the humidity. And so here's the basic idea. Uh, that can certainly be done, right? Here we've got uh, the, the, the Y uh, contribution and the T contribution and we just need to add them together uh, with the right coefficients. So here are the coefficients that we want. We want Cp times T uh, plus delta H of vaporization times Y and then take the derivative of that and then what we're really doing is taking the derivative of the enthalpy itself. And so if we multiply that by the uh, the gas flow rate uh, and we multiply that by our by our enthalpy uh, then that becomes one of the terms in our enthalpy balance. Uh, over here on the right hand side we have our, uh, our heat transfer term and our mass transfer term. These are coming because we added those two equations together and so you will see them added together with the coefficients that we multiplied them by like the heat of vaporization. So if we just simplify this a little bit, that becomes G D H D Z uh, is the mass transfer term plus the heat transfer term, or sorry, uh, heat transfer term plus mass transfer term multiplied by 
the heat of vaporization. Now we can use Chilton Colburn. Uh, so Chilton Colburn tells us that K, mass transfer coefficient over V times the Schmidt number to the two thirds, is H over V. Uh, times a heat capacity, times a total concentration, times a Prandtl number to the two-thirds. And so for a gas, we can, we can approximate that the Schmidt number and the Prandtl number are comparable. And we're going to use this identity that K, uh, the heat transfer coefficient, or sorry, the mass transfer coefficient that we're used to, is just uh, KY over C total. And that allows us to write uh, that the heat transfer coefficient is this Ky times the uh, molar heat capacity. When we plug this uh, result into the, uh, the gas phase flow rate multiplied by dH dZ term, then uh, things simplify down quite a bit. We see here that this is the uh, the uh, enthalpy at saturation minus the enthalpy out in the bulk uh, and so we're multiplying that by the mass transfer coefficient times the area per volume of the packing and getting that that must be the, the, the flow rate of air times the derivative of the enthalpy with respect to Z. Okay, so these are sort of filling in all of those uh, identities that I just made use of uh, in the bulk and at the uh, and at the, at the liquid interface. So now there's uh, sort of one, one task left to do, and that is to find the required height, uh, which we've been calling L, of the tower, right? So, um, so this is this G over KYA. You'll notice that that is a parameter that naturally pops out of the preceding equation. So you get a G over this KYA, and that's called a heat transfer unit. Um, it is a, or an enthalpy transfer unit. Uh, it is uh, going to give us a, a single number now uh, that's going to have units of a length. And so our, our L uh, in this equation, this is the height of the tower, uh, after integration of our design equation just comes up to be, so this is our equation that we're integrating here, uh, just comes up to have this form. So you're going to have to do this numerically, and, uh, and nevertheless, though, it can give you a prediction for the height of tower that you will need to cool a given stream of water by a given amount. Um, let me go ahead and, and plow through and show uh, this example calculation. So this is going to be a pretty long video. Uh, in this example, we have a countercurrent tower and it's supposed to cool water that's flowing at 2150 kilograms per minute. The water is entering at 60 degrees C and should be cooled down to 25 degrees C. The air is going to be fed dry to the tower at 60 moles per meter squared per second with a dry bulb temperature of 30 degrees C and a dew point of 10 degrees C. Okay, so we've got air flowing past uh, a, a water stream and so we know that the, uh, the um, uh, that dew point temperature is going to be the temperature at our interface, basically. Uh, so the water flux then should be 40% uh, of the maximum allowed water flux. Uh, so the, the tower is going to be packed with wood slats uh, that give an uh, HTU of G over, that's G over KYA, that's equal to 3 meters in length. And so we're supposed to find the height of the tower required to do this cooling, cooling job. So the first thing that we want to do is to plot our equilibrium line. Uh, that is just the saturation, uh, the saturation enthalpy uh, as a function of temperature. And so that's going to go from 25 degrees C out to 60 degrees C. That's where we want to plot it. And uh, now we can compute or we can read from the psychrometric chart the humidity and the enthalpy of air uh, with a dew point uh, that is a wet bulb temperature of 10 degrees C and a dry bulb temperature of 30 degrees C. Okay, so we've got the, uh, we've got the temperature difference here is uh, 20 degrees and uh, we know the heat of vaporization and we know the uh, heat capacity of water and so we should be able to predict uh, that um, we should predict the enthalpy of the air and the humidity of the air from those two things. Okay, so that now is going to give me um, that now is going to give me uh, the uh, the maximum possible uh, ratio for this L over G, right? 
Uh, so what we're gonna, so what we've got so far is an equilibrium line. We've got a, a point on the operating line. That's my starting point right there. I still don't know anything yet about the. Um, I still don't know anything yet about the, uh, the operating line slope, right? So we have to first calculate the maximum slope that this operating line can have. And Kussler has done that for us, right? If you, if you start at this point and you use different values of L over G and you plot this operating line, you will see that some of them are really fast and they cross through uh, really early. Some of them are like this and they have lots of room to go ahead and increase that slope towards the equilibrium line. Uh, but if you pick just the right slope that you come up here and you just touch and then move on as a tangent to that equilibrium line, that's going to give you the maximum possible value of the L uh, times C uh, over G uh, parameter in this operating line. And Kussler finds that that maximum slope is 230 joules per mole per degree C. And of course you have to do this numerically. Okay, so if you've, if you've got that the maximum slope is 230 uh, is this number, and you know that this number must be equal to this, uh, the G and the heat capacity were given, and so that allows us to find the maximum value of this, uh, of this liquid uh, flow rate, which is 180 moles uh, of water per meter squared per second. Okay, so... Okay, now what we want to do is to take the actual flow rate, L, and require that that be 40% less than this L max, this 180 that we just computed. Okay, so, so we're going to take 0.6 of that 180 and get 110 moles per meter squared per second. And now we've, now we've arrived uh, by first finding the maximum possible flow rate and getting this point, uh, and then down adjusting that, that flow rate until, until we you know, meet our uh, design specs that say we should be 40% over designed here, then we end up with another point on our operating line. This one actually has the, the characteristics of a line. And so, so we're done now. We have the equilibrium line and we have the operating line. And now what we want to do is to integrate uh, the design equation to get the appropriate value of L. Okay, so the design equation was dH dz is KYA over G times H sat over H. H sat minus H, sorry. Uh, so integrating this uh, from Z going from 0 up to L uh, and with this, this HTU parameter G over KYA. Uh, so we have dH over H sat uh, minus H and that's going from the uh, inlet enthalpy of, uh, of the gas, right, this is at the bottom of the, of the tower, uh, to the outlet enthalpy of the gas, which is going to be pretty high. And, and that gives you L equals 8.1 meters. And uh, I encourage you to take a look at Gene Coplis' book on this stuff. Uh, he uses some different conventions and has quite a thorough discussion of, of uh, tower, cooling tower design in his book with many, dis with many examples. Uh, so, uh, I think that's it. Um, for those of you who want a handy reference, you can remember that there are several different definitions of humidity here. We've got uh, amount of water vapor in the air over amount of dry air. Uh, it's pretty easy to write that in this particular form where you've got the 18 over 29 times the vapor pressure of water uh, over the actual pressure minus the vapor pressure of water. Uh, we can also define a saturated humidity, which is going to be 8 over 29 times P vapor uh, over P minus P vapor. And, and uh, finally, there are two properties that are sort of derived from those, and those are the percent humidity, which is the actual humidity over the humidity at saturation uh, times 100%, uh, and also the relative humidity, which is the partial pressure of water divided by the partial pressure of water at uh, at its vapor pressure multiplied by 100%.